hard to see for old people here. Just looking at Larry, um, I mean, we could spend an hour talking about his lost water bottle. We could spend an hour talking about um, those phone calls where you'd actually try and find not just a seat, but a, a bed to lie down on, because it was going to be a long one. Um, we could talk about the fact that even when you were late for something and you were waiting, he had to have that one more cigarette, and then you could go. But um, all those things are going to make all of us miss Larry, and I don't want you to miss Larry. I want you to know Larry. So I'm going to tell you a very brief story about the time Larry Harvey went to Burning Man. The year was 2014, the month was March, and the theme was caravansary. Larry and I were having a chicken tikka masala dinner, he loved Indian food, and were musing about mysterious journeys along the Silk Road. He wanted to make the tents surrounding the man feel like an ancient marketplace even though obviously nothing was going to be for sale. He said he wanted it to feel like a souk in the movies. No idea of time or place where people go meandering in the marketplace in North Africa and everyone's begging for your attention and there's, there's chickens under feet and there's, there's people speaking in languages you don't understand and there's piles of spices. He had the whole thing in his mind. And then someone catches your eye and invites you into a dimly lit stall, which is no bigger than the size of the rug on the floor, and they offer you tea, and they show you their wares, and, and then you bargain with them, and you leave with something you didn't know you desperately wanted. That's what he wanted the soup to feel like. Well, when it came to experiencing the caravansary theme, Larry had it all in his head, but it was going to be manifested in practical terms. The regional groups were going to populate most of the stalls. But he was still stuck on that idea of, of bargaining, how a souk, a, a marketplace, both exchanged ideas and languages, but also things. He wanted to include that, that tension, the tug of bargaining, the, the proprietor and the prospective customer, that interplay. He wanted that adrenaline of have and want. And it really mattered to him. How could we get that? How could we capture that essence? Well, I said we could have a little shop in the souk. We could fill it with treasures, and then people could bargain for them, and then we'd give them away. We'd give them to them. They just wouldn't have to pay, but we'd still have that bargaining. Larry's blue eyes widened which is one of the most beautiful things you could ever hope to see. He paused, he smiled, and it was a new smile because he just had his entire set of teeth replaced. <laughs> it had been a long and very painful process, but he was very pleased with the result. And he was actually learning how to smile in a new way. He hadn't thought of doing a shop himself, but it could be salutary. It could have, he started imagining this and speaking it out loud, it could have a, a front room and, and a secret back room where you could invite people to close the deal, and, and rugs and candles and incense and mystery. We spent the rest of the evening kind of play acting the whole seraglio scenario. I figured he would let it drop once he realized what he was asking for. Um, Larry was actually quite shy and spent a good part of the event reading books in his trailer when he wasn't scheduled to speak or meet. He's the only person I know who would bring literally 10 books to Burning Man and try and get through many of them. But I began to, to hear him describing these new tents that were being bought for the souk, and then he'd say, and I'm going to have a little shop there offering treasures in our family for 13 generations. He was stuck on that phrase, 13 generations. For an orphan from Eastern Oregon, being able to count his family back 13 generations was an impossible ideal, and it mattered to him. Of course, Larry's idea of having a shop at Burning Man was entirely theoretical. He was a bit of a magical thinker when it came to production. Yes? 
yes? Uh, the treasures would have to materialize, as would the rugs and pillows and lanterns, and he was not going shopping. But Thrift Town was overflowing with dented brass platters of the Taj Mahal and dolls bought at the airport and hand-painted spoons with letters that we couldn't read, and they all made their way to my garage. Stuart Mangrum said we should call it the Shop of El Ari, and we did. We actually put it on the map there. And uh, then Stuart joined me, and one Saturday in July, we actually took him to one of the Indian wedding stores in Berkeley to find his outfit. Now, costume was clearly not Larry's thing, but he found this fancy blue kurta that made him look quite elegant and mysterious, and he figured he could wear it to the autumnal. So that made it not a costume, sort of like the Cuban shirts he wore every day. And then it was time to go out to the desert, which is the indigenous home of souks everywhere. When the tents went up, Larry would come out to supervise the setup of our very small corner space, the size of a rug. We'd had an outer room of things that you want but cannot have, and an inner sanctum of things that you can have but do not want. <laughs> Turning the paradigm on its head. We had lanterns and rugs and antique sari fabric at the door and candles and it, it, looked, it looked quite good. Someone had offered him a hideous desk with a formica top, kind of 70s mustard color, and he was very gleeful to put it in the back to close the deal. Someone else had given him a large hookah and we created a little corner area with pillows for that. Flash produced a box of porcelain mouse figurines and it all kind of came together. It was crazy and haphazard and just what he'd imagined. We opened at 6 p.m. on Monday night. Larry arrived in his new non-costume outfit. His friend Jan had learned how to tie a turban and did him up perfectly. With his hat replaced with yards of blue fabric, his aviator sunglasses, a long flowing kurta over his rumpled jeans, and his dazzling new smile, he was El Ari, a character out of Indiana Jones and his own imagination. A beautiful belly dancer stood just outside the door, beckoning to guests. Inside, a mystic offered a quick reading of their aura and a dot of tikka powder on the forehead. As guests would survey the wares in the dim candlelight, El Ari would ask what appealed to them, gently probing. What, why does this catch your eye, he'd say. W what does it stir in you? He'd haggle with them for it, withholding the agreement until he was sure the person had chosen the object of their heart's desire. Then he would bestow it upon them, admonishing them to care for something that had been in his family for 15, 13 generations. Occasionally, there would be someone who couldn't decide or who couldn't find anything they desired, quite understandably. Then El Ari would invite them into the back room with the special objects and the wise grandmother. They would peer through the beaded curtain to see our friend Elba as an oracle heavily swathed in veils. He would suggest they consult with her for a bit. He understood that different forms of wisdom were sometimes required in matters of the heart, and he was more than happy to share the limelight. Throughout the week, Larry would tell people in first camp to come by a shop in the souk. After checking in with Miss Kelly about his commitments, he'd ask, are, are, are we opening the shop tomorrow? I have time in the afternoon. This was Larry scheduling himself to go to Burning Man something I had never seen him do. He was enjoying his relative anonymity and the totally absurdist theater of bargaining when there was nothing for sale. He always defined decommodification as reducing something to its lowest common denominator, and he made a big distinction between something of value being for sale versus a commodity. So bargaining without money for things of perceived value amused him no end. Friday was our last afternoon. The souk was being closed to prepare for the burn, so we had to be aggressive with our gifting. 
Larry was turbaned and in fine form, despite the whiteout that turned everything in the shop into one color. The weather diminished the number of people who actually ventured out to come into the souk, meaning we had to really sell hard to get rid of the stuff. Larry got a little more aggressive, encouraging visitors to take one, two, three items if they wished. First he gave away the hookah, that was easy. Then someone actually wanted the Formica desk, great, we helped them move that along. The challenge of dispersal brought out more El Ari and less Larry. Family heirloom, ancient treasure, everything must go. <laughs> it was amazing. It was an amazing thing to watch, I must say. Late in the afternoon, a woman wandered in who didn't seem to want anything. She was shy and hard to engage. She didn't really appreciate the irony of a shop where nothing was for sale. Larry asked her a bit about her week, and she spoke about her family, especially a daughter whose first day of school she was very sad to miss. She peeked into the back room, but didn't go in. Finally, she asked if she could take a small mouse figurine for her daughter, and quietly left. Larry was actually touched that this gift was becoming a gift again, knowing that families really mattered deeply to him, whether he knew the individual or not. He always said that the principle of gifting without expectation of return was based on how families behaved with one another. He said that families, chosen and birth, is where people share and give and don't keep score. About a half hour later, the woman came back. She stood slightly taller this time and was more sure of herself, as if she'd had a revelation. She walked up to Larry. I know who you are she said. May I give you a hug? Now, Larry was not a, not a big hugger. Um, he would usually accept a hug, but he'd finish it quickly with that awkward pat on the back that made you knew it was finished. Um, but this time he really welcomed her. He opened his arms and he smiled. And then she smiled and thanked him and disappeared. You could tell this encounter made him really happy. He was grinning from ear to ear, and you could see his blue eyes twinkling as brightly as his new teeth. I think she got it, he said. That was all he really wanted from this experience, to provide a place of wonder, to radically include you, and to offer a gift of something that you really wanted. And he did that with his little souk shop, and he did that with his big event, and he did that with his glorious life. Larry gave us treasures to take home and inspiration to take forward. And we are sure that his playfulness and his generosity and his great love will remain in this family for 13 generations. <laughs>